should have watched Sankofa Review. It was not Sankofa Review. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, before, I'm going to keep you guys waiting for Dr. Von Sardimer. Just a little more. Um, but before uh, we move into the second part of today's uh, presentation, and I learned something in that interview from Dr. Van Sardimer, and I'm going to quote him here. He could correct me if, I was, if I'm wrong. He said that it was African people who taught the Europeans how to eat before they ate in a lump. The Moors. Yes, the Moors. Yeah, taught them how to eat. They're the ones who created parks and so forth and so forth. So we can't give you it all in a lump. So we've got to break it up. And one punctuation that breaks up this large course meal that we have today is to again introduce you to the rest of students from the John Henry Clark course who we did not meet in the first time. And so here they come. Please give them a round of applause, please. See, this John Henry Clark course has, has a lot of impact on McGavis College. Uh, Brinkley Zozer is now, he's the new, newly elected president of the Student Body Association, SGE. So, you know, we can change some things around here. <laughs> and so maybe the next time we have an, an occasion like this, the whole student body, not only the John Henry Clark body, student, students, Will, uh, will, will help to um, foster a situation like this. Take a bow. <laughs> Thank you. This is uh, certainly not the desert. This is part of the full course of the meal. And the person who is going to serve this meal to us is none other than Ivan Van Sortimer, who was born in Guyana, South America. You know why I'm very proud of him too, right? Because uh, he walks in the footsteps of uh, great, other great Guyanese, um, Edgar Meckelhalzer, uh, Jan Carew, George G.M. James, that people know a whole, a whole lot about, and, but they don't somehow associate him with Guyana, but that's okay. He's an African person. Um, Walter Rodney. He doesn't walk in Walter Rodney's footsteps. I think Walter Rodney walked in his footsteps, given their age. He was educated at the School of Orient, Oriental and African Studies, London University, and Rutgers Graduate School, and holds degrees in African Studies and Anthropology. From 1957 to 1959, he served as a press and broadcasting officer in Guyana Information Services. So those who watched the, the, the interview today saw him, right? It is vintage uh, uh, press reporting style. I hope you could give us some of that, right? Um, during the decades of the 60s, he broadcasted weekly from Britain to Africa and the Caribbean. He is a literary critic, a linguist, and an anthropologist, and has made a name in all three fields. A genius, right, isn't he? As a literary critic, he's the author of Caribbean Writers, a collection of critical essays on the Caribbean novel. He's also the author of several major literary reviews published in Denmark, India, Britain, and the United States. He was honored for his work in the field by being asked by the Nobel Committee of the Swedish Academy to nominate candidates for the Nobel Prize in Literature from 1976 to 1980. I don't know why you didn't get one of those prizes, Dr. Von Sodom. You served too much, right? <laughs> you can't nominate yourself, right? I hope we could woo somebody to nominate him after today. He has also been honored as a historian of world repute by being asked to join UNESCO's International Commission for Rewriting the Scientific and Cultural History of Mankind. As a linguist, he has published essays on the dialect of the Sea Islands of Georgia, of, of the Georgia Coast. He's also the compiler of the Swahili Dictionary of Legal Terms based on his fieldwork in Tanzania, East Africa in 1967. 
He's the author of They Came Before the Columbus, The African Presidents in Ancient America. I hope everybody in this audience has a copy of it. And if you don't, make sure that Dr. Van Sotima reissues that book somehow. This was published by Random House in 1977 and is now in its 2021st printing. It was published in, the, in French in 1981 and the same year was awarded the Clarence L. Holt Prize, a prize awarded every two years for a work of excellence in literature and the humanities relating to the cultural heritage of Africa and African diaspora. Professor of African Studies at Rutgers University, Van Sardema was also a visiting professor at Princeton University. He's the editor of the Journal of African Civilizations, which he founded in 1979 and has published several major anthologies which have influenced the development of a new multicultural curriculum in the United States. These anthologies, made, these anthologies included Blacks in Science, Ancient and Modern, Black Women in Antiquity, Egypt Revisited, Egypt Child of Africa, Nile Valley Civilizations, Black Presence in, in the Art of the Americas, African Presence in Early Asia, co-authored with Ronoko Rashidi, African Presence in Early Europe, African Presence in Early America, Great African Thinkers, co-editor with Larry Lo Williams, Great Black Leaders, and Ancient and Modern, and the Golden Age of the Moors. Professor Van Sardema has lectured at more than 100 universities in the United States and has also lectured in Canada, the United States, South America, and Europe. He defended his highly controversial thesis on the African presence in pre-Columbian America before the Smithsonian, which published his address in 1995. He also appeared before a congressional committee July, 19, July 7, 1987 to challenge the Columbus myth Dr. Van Sardema's work is also in, uh, accompanied by a brilliant photographer who is his wife, Jackie L. Patton Van Sardema. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me the utmost pleasure and honor to introduce to all of you, now for the first time, <laughs> but to present to you once again, none other than Ivan Van Sardema. I appeared before Congress on July the 7th, 1987. I'd been summoned there to give due cause why I should not they should not refer to Columbus's accidental stumble into the Caribbean, which he thought was the backside of India, as a discovery. I remember when I entered the chamber, this gentleman, head of the Queen's Centenary Commission, came up to me and said, you don't mean to say you come here to say Columbus did not discover America? I said, yes. He said, you must be mad. I said, you look mad to me too. <laughs> as a result of my presentation, Congress decided to delete the word discovery from official documents. I presented a vast, vast body of evidence, um, and it, it started as a peculiar accident because um, I was in the British Information, I was first in the Guyana Information Services, then I was in the British Information Services, and I Never intended to come to America. I'd heard such dark things about America. But I'd heard dark things about most countries. Anyway, I was on my way back. Uh, my prime minister had invited me to read poetry at the occasion of our, the independence of our country, independence celebrations, because I was known then as a poet. And I was on my way back, and Yan Karu, a famous Guyanese author invited me to come to America, and I said, no, 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 I'll never go to America. I've heard such dark things about America. No, no, no. He said, don't be foolish. There are dark things about all places in the world. You come and check it out. So I came there on a Saturday, 
Sunday morning he was asleep when I came down into his library and I saw three green books, Africa and the Discovery of America, by Leo Wiener. This was done, I think, in the 1920s. The problem with Leo Wiener, however, he was strictly a linguist. And I felt that finding a number of African words in America would not be enough to prove the point, to prove something like that which would up overturn a great amount of thinking would call for a vast body of evidence in many fields. So I, I actually began a critique of this. 30 years ago, I actually began to attack my own subject. I didn't know it would become my subject because it wasn't good enough. Linguistics, I, I was trained as a linguist, and I knew that you could occasionally get a number of words. You'd have to prove a lot of things. You'd have to have evidence in many fields to prove something like this. So I sent it to the editor, and I said, if anyone could show me just a few sculptures or portraits of Africans in America before Columbus, I would take another hard look at this matter because he, he presented no pictorial proof and he knew nothing about skeletal material so he couldn't provide skeletal proof and the editor at Random House, Charles Harris, called me up and said, Van Sertima, something strange has happened on my table. You ended your piece by saying, if anyone could show me images of Africans in America before Columbus, I would take another hard look at this matter and I turned the page and I turned the page and I turned the page, there were seven images of Africans. John Williams, the novelist, author of The Man Who Cried I Am, had been to Mexico and met a strange German, last of the Royal House of Germany. Hitler had put him in charge of the German embassy in DC. And something happened and he was dismissed. I was later to find out why he was dismissed by Hitler because Hitler sent the wrong a circular saying, that everyone in the diplomatic service has to sign a statement saying they're a pure Aryan. And von Wuttenau wrote back, now he was a conk, the last of the royal house in Germany. This was strange for von Wuttenau, strange for anybody in that position. Wrote back to say, there is no such thing as a pure Aryan. All people have black blood. Oh God, he had to flee after that. Because <laughs> Hitler would have gotten him. So I rushed off to Mexico to meet this strange man. And I went to his chateau, and he'd heard about me because I had written him first and told him what I had done. And we sat in that place, okay? We sat on his steps half the night arguing because he couldn't, you have to show me a hell of a lot of evidence to convince me of something that everybody believes is, is true history. And he says, I said, I have to see these heads. He said, I have a few in my study. I said, that's not good enough. I have to be sure that they are valid, that you are now making this up. He was a little annoyed by that. He wanted to throw me out of the house. But nonetheless, I persisted. You have to prove this to me. I need to see sculptures of these people. And he says, they're not in the big museums. They don't take chances like that in the big museums. You have to go to private collections and the next day he started to take me to private collections and I was utterly stunned. You would be surprised how much history is hidden in private museums. They don't allow these things in the big places. It's just like in, in Egypt. I am responsible for returning to the modern Egyptians the splinters of the Sphinx's nose and chin which Napoleon's army blew off. A friend of mine, Garland Roberts, an adventurer, he was in England, he went into the British Museum, and he found that they had the splinters of the Sphinx's nose and chin. How he did that, but he's a, he's a fellow, he's, dare, he's a daredevil. He would risk his life just to prove a point. And I says, you go back there. I'm gonna pay your way to Britain. You go back and photograph the damn thing. Pretend you are a, you know, messenger boy, whatever it is, get a job there, get the damn thing. And he brought back startling pictures. And I called Sheikh Anta Diop, the head of the radiocarbon laboratory in Dakar, he's dead now. He was the leading African scientist. And I got in touch with him and I told him what had happened. And I got in touch with Gamal Abdel Mokhtar, the, the 
the Arab delegate at UNESCO. Sheikh Kanta was at UNESCO too. And I got in touch with, I told Carla Roberts, you know, he has to be on the phone. And, I, and we started a conversation with the British Museum. And I started out by saying, sir, we understand and we have hard visual proof that you have the splinters of the Sphinx's nose and chin in your museum. And I have the Arab delegate at UNESCO here and the African delegate, etc. And we'd like to negotiate the return of the splinters of the Sphinx's nose and chin to the Egyptians. Now, okay, okay. Now, now, Van Sertima, we can't do that. <laughs> See, most of the things we have in our museums come from all over the world. If we started returning things to this and that country, we'll have no museums. <laughs> I said, sir, we're not asking you to destroy the museum. This is a specific object. This is a matter of the very gravest importance. I have on the line with me, Gamal Abdul Mokhtar, the Arab delegate, Sheikh Antidi Up, the African delegate, Myself, Garland Roberts, who has proof that they were the pieces, it's me, he photographed them. And he said, well, we will consider it. Do you know, Sheikh Antis spoke, I had a French translator, Sheikh Antis spoke, I spoke, Garland Roberts spoke. Do you know the Arab delegate, we're returning it to the bloody Arabs, you know. He never said a bloody word because the Arabs are not Egyptian. Don't make any mistake about that. It's just like we're in this room here. This is America. It would be hard to find a Native American in this room. The world has changed dramatically. There have been half a dozen invasions of Egypt, the Persians, the Greeks, the Syrians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Arabs. That is not Egypt. Egypt is no longer Egyptian. They have not a damn thing to do with the building of the pyramids. We now have hard proof, very hard proof, that Egypt was African when the pyramids were built. There is no question about it. This is not guesswork. This is not theory. We found the skeletons in the ancient graves. We found sculptures, which you'll never see when you go to Egypt. They don't put those things on display. But now we have the hard proof. And I'll deal with that later when we come to deal with the Egyptian section of this lecture. But I appeared before the Congressional Committee and I presented 12 witnesses, all European. Because they're gonna say I'm Afrocentric if I show them Af this African said this. No, 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 I'm going to take the very people that you think you will listen to Columbus is the first person. I said, that's how I began. I, I'm not the first person to suggest there were Africans in America before Columbus. Christopher Columbus is the first person to say that. He actually says in the Journal of the Second Voyage that when he was in Haiti, Native Americans came to them and told them that black-skinned people had come from the South and Southeast trading in gold-tipped metal spears. Columbus may or may not have believed, but he actually collected samples of these spears. They were sent back to Spain. They were meticulously, microscopically examined in Spain. And they were found to be identical, not just similar, identical with spears being forged in African Guinea. Of 32 parts, 18 were of gold, 6 of silver, and 8 of copper. Not only were they identical metallurgically, the words the Africans were using for these spears were the words the Americans were using. African word for gold, Ghana. That's why it's called Ghana. Gold Empire, the Golden Empire. And I checked it out in several African languages, Sarakole, Saninke, Gadzago, Kane, Vayan Mende, Kani. You see, it's Kani. Kono, it's kanin. Pule, it's kane. That's the word for gold. And that's the word Americans are using. And they have their own bloody gold word. Why are they using this strange word? And presenting material which when checked out, when the metallurgists checked it out in Europe, 
They found the space were identical in their ratio of gold, silver, and copper alloys. How could you have linguistic and metallurgical identities like that? It is utterly impossible. Not only that, I then went beyond that. I not just showed Columbus Ferdinand wrote a book about his father and he said, my father told me that he saw Negroes north of Honduras. Columbus know what the so-called Negro looks like. He was in Africa. That's how my book began. Columbus sitting at a table in Africa, arguing with the, the Portuguese. I tracked this man down. It is possible when you become very famous, people could track every little thing. Who you slept with, <laughs> who you tried to kill, <laughs> who slept with your wife or your husband, everything. And one found a hell of a lot of stuff on this clown, <laughs> or rather this villain. He did some horrible things. He's, yet he's known as the great discoverer. Ferdinand said, my father told me he saw Negroes north of Honduras. He not only heard of them in Haiti, he actually saw them north of Honduras. Vasco Nunes de Balboa on September the 25th in the year 1513, I've got it down to the day. He's coming down the slopes of Paracu in Darien, which we now call Panama. And he and his men saw two tall black men among the Native Americans. They are startled. They haven't brought no black people there. Several of them commented it. Peter Martyr said they must have been shipwrecked. Then he also said they were Ethiopians. Well, Ethiopians, the word Ethiopian is not used for people of Ethiopia. The reason why Ethiopia gets that name, Ethiopia means burnt skin. People of burnt skin were generally called an Ethiopian. So it's not referring to Ethiopia. Peter Martyr said they must have been shipwrecks. Lopez de Gamara said these blacks Balboa saw in the Indies were identical with the blacks we saw in Guinea. Rodrigo de Colmenares saw blacks. Captain of Balboa saw blacks east of the Gulf of San Miguel. Alphonse de Catafax reported in his book, Study of Panama. Um, no, Labe Brasur de Bourbon was the guy who went to Panama, said there were two distinct people in Panama. The Mandinga, black skin, and the Thule, red skin. The red skin would be the Native American. And Alphonse de Catafax presents us with a map showing blacks in various places in early America. The Charus of Brazil, the Jamasi of Florida, and the, Caribs of Saint, the black Caribs of St. Vincent, pre-Columbian. Alonso Ponce cites them off Campeche in Mexico. River Palacio cites them off Tegucigalpa in the Nicaraguan Honduran border. Raman Pane, a priest, speaks of them as the black gold traders. Fray Gregorio Garcia cites them off Cartagena, Colombia. A dozen Europeans, Christopher Columbus, Ferdinand Columbus, Vasco Nunes de Balboa, Peter Marte, Lopez de Gamara, Rodrigo de Colmenares, Alphonse de Catafax, Labe Brasso de Bourbou, Alonso Ponce, River Palacio, Raman Pane, Fray Gregory Garcia, seeing things that are not there. <laughs> Probably blacks are haunting their dreams. It's absurd. You cannot have 12 eyewitnesses to event that never happened. And I have not just 12 eyewitnesses. That is just one piece of evidence. I have 12 pieces. So it's not just the eyewitnesses, the metallurgical evidence that it was tested, they were found to be identical in the ratio of gold, silver, and copper alloys as spares being, for, spare being forged in African Guinea. 18 parts gold, 6 silver, 8 copper. How could you have identities like that? Then there's the linguistic identities, which I just mentioned. Saracolis and Inke, Gadzago, Vai, Mende, Kisi, Kono, Pule. Went through half a dozen African languages to check out the word. And they're using the same bloody word that Americans are using. How is that possible? If it was a European, you only need one piece of evidence. I'm giving you seven. How could you deny that? And it doesn't stop there. There is the botanical evidence. Take the banana. We use the word banana for the banana. But that's not the African word for the banana. The word for the banana is bakoko in Africa. 
banana is an Arab word. The Africans didn't have bananas. The bananas were introduced into Africa by the Arabs very early, and they have a different word for it, banana. They do not have banana. They have bakoko. I have checked the bakoko word because they found bananas in Peru. Peru didn't have bananas. Pre-Columbian Peru is not supposed to have, they didn't have original bananas. The banana, the reason why we found the banana is because when they buried their dead, they would have ceremonies every year, the year of the, the, the day of the death, and they would put fruit in the grave, and among the fruit they put in the grave was the banana, and they do not have original, they do not originally have bananas. That has been checked out. It's only found in these graves. If they were eating the banana, we'd find out a kind of evidence. And the word for the banana in Peru is the same as the word for Af the Africans have. We call it banana, but the Africans call it bakoko. So I started checking out the words in Peru. How did this banana appear? They don't have bananas at that time in South America. And found in Galibi, it's bakuku. In Oyapok, it's Baku. In Oyampi, it's ba these are all South American languages. In Oyampi, it's Baku. Man, Tupi is Baku Ba because pa and pa are interchangeable plosives. In, in Apiacus, it's Baku Wa. In Puri, it's Bahu. So you have Baku Ko, Baku Ku, Baku, Baku Me, Baku Ba, Baku Ba, Baho. Can't happen unless you have a connection, a very early connection. And then comes the oceanographic evidence, because most people say, here is Africa and here is America. How could the Africans cross? They only have canoes that Tarzan can turn over in the movies. <laughs> but that is not, that's another myth again. First of all, there are two things here that they did not take into account. I lived on a river. My father was superintendent of road and river transport over an area that was as large as Scotland and Wales. I grew up in the river. I grew up in the river, and my mother and father were divorced. That was the first divorce in our country, recorded divorce in our country. They later remarried. That was the first recorded remarriage in our country. <laughs> I wouldn't advise you to do it. It doesn't work. <laughs> but anyway, they did it in order to save the children, and I am grateful to them, but they suffered. But anyway, to come back, you have this knowledge. I had this knowledge of currents because we, I used to swim three and a half miles across the water to the air base. That was a big thing to show how you are. You know, boys are like that. They're always playing the ass, trying to prove they're strong. <laughs> Several of us drunk. So you could see what I mean by playing the fool. Anyway, I used to swim across the river, so I was extremely strong. And I knew about currents. Because most people think the river is just like that. No, the river is alive. In certain parts of the falls in Guyana, the water is running as fast as a motor car. You don't have to have an engine. You have to know how to steer. Or it hits you against the rock and you're blown to pieces. The water moves as fast as a motor car. And in those waters, they do not move as fast as a motor car, the great rivers, but they move with force and take you places. And we have discovered three currents of Africa that take you automatically to America. There's one of the Cape Verde, one of the Senegambia coast, one of the southern coast of Africa. Once you are caught in those currents, you have to come to America unless the fish get you first. <laughs> Whether you have an engine or not, that, the water is the engine. It's very powerful. And it's exactly where those currents end that we find the African presence. It goes to Mexico. It goes into other parts of America. It goes to Brazil. They recently found, listen to this, look at the lies involved here. They recently found an African Negro woman. I say Negro because not all blacks are Negro. The African has six faces. For example, if you're in a dry African climate, you have a narrow nose. If you're in a wet or moist African climate, you have a broad nose. Most people don't know that. They don't know they have six types of African. They're the type. They're all black. 
where they have the nilotic type, the so-called true Negro type, the, the all, all sorts of types they have. And I have in my new book the faces of the various types. And all of these types appear. But what is most extraordinary is the evidence we have of their ships. They had the ships. Thor Heyerdahl became world famous because he got the Baduma people on Lake Chad to build a boat that the Africans built before Christ. Thor Heyerdahl used the boat the Africans built before Christ. They showed him the model. They built the boat. He financed it, a boat they were using before Christ, and it crossed the Atlantic successfully. Heyerdahl told me, Van Sertima, we did not even have to fish. The fish jumped on board. Because in those, in those currents are millions of fish, millions. And it wasn't just Hayadar, Alim Bombard also tested African boats. And, and they made it in less time than Vespucci. You have several, if you study the, the the work I have done in, in the, the new book, Early America Revisited, you see these guys made it in less time than the European boats because of their knowledge of the currents. And they're not only currents off the Cape Verde, off the Senegambia coast, off the southern coast of Africa that take you to America, they're currents that spin you back towards Africa. We have an evidence of a boat, American boat, Native Americans landing in Africa, 62 BC, there were seven in the boat because it was an accident. They were taken to Africa because the currents that not only take you there and pull you back. We don't have any evidence of Europeans doing that. We have it in Native American, 62 BC. That is in my book, they came before Columbus. And Apart from this oceanographic evidence, there's the navigational evidence. That's the boats. The Africans had the boats. The Africans built the boat for Heidel. Heidel became world famous about how he crossed the Atlantic. He didn't build the boat. It was Africans who built the boat for him, a boat they had used before Christ, the Buduma people on Lake Chad. It's in my new book, Early America. You'll see the boat. The Africans built it. They could easily have crossed. And when you cross, the current actually takes you into the Caribbean, to Brazil, or parts of South America, to Mexico, etc. Recently, the, listen to this, look at the cheating going on, look at the profound dishonesty of scientists. They found a Negro woman in Brazil, in Brazil, where the currents come from Africa. Caribbean, Brazil, etc. They found a Negro woman in Brazil, 12,500 years old. That is even before the Native Americans. Now, Negroes always came from Africa, but it was so embarrassing that they suggested, yes, it's a Negro, but it came from Asia. <laughs> now, this is Brazil, you know. Brazil is on the Atlantic coast. To come from Asia, you have to get a boat that's going to take you all the way to South America and then you, you, you have no car. Currents may take you, help you to get to South America, but then you have to walk to Brazil. Then you get the tip, you have to walk, walk all the way to Brazil to drop your skull. <laughs> and the, 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 the New York Times ran the story like that, you know, thinking, and they even changed the name. When they found this Negroid woman, they call her Louisa because the first human we found in North is Lucy, an African. So they call her Louisa. But when it got to the New York Times, they call her Valherbe or Malherbe or something like that. And she comes from Asia. Niggers don't come from Africa anymore. They come from Asia. You find them in the wrong time, in the wrong place. <laughs> Jesus Christ, I mean, well, how far can you take this nonsense? It, it is absurd. And you find also Skeletal evidence, listen to this, because I have to be very careful here. I was in two intelligence services in the world, the Guyana Intelligence Service and the British Intelligence Service, and you're not supposed to tell secrets. So I have to say this in a way 
that shows that I don't know nothing. Okay. <clears throat> they found two African skeletons in the United States Virgin Island at Hull Bay, St. Thomas. These skeletons were found in a strata or layer of art which is datable 1250 AD, two and a half centuries before Columbus. But they could not date the bones. Something strange had entered the bones of these skeletons. Now, I know why something strange had happened, why something strange had entered because of something that was done in that area. And I'm not allowed to talk about it. All I could say is now far from Cuba, and Cuba was giving us some trouble, and we had to tell Castro, come on, we're the world power, so don't play the fool with us. We'll teach you a lesson. That's all I'm allowed to say. But I went down to the Virgin Islands when I heard about these skeletons. And they promised, I, I shamed Vesalius, the archaeologist of the island. I spoke to the whole university, a big crowd, shamed him. He said he'd allow me to see the skeletons. Come there by 12 o'clock the next day. I arrived 10 to 12, raced across the island. Arrived at 10 to 12, the door was locked. Well, I am a very nice person. But when I get angry, I'm not very nice. So I ran at the door, wham! <laughs> Shook the place, the police came out. What are you doing here, sir? I was invited here. You know the place, don't you see the place is closed? Yes, sir, but I, it's very strange that it should be closed. I was invited here, I was to come here, but move along, sir, or we have to arrest you. Well, I moved along. But fortunately for me, friends on the island who'd heard of my interest and I'd spoken to the university there, they took me to a rock pool at St. John. That was St. Thomas where they found the skeletons. They took me to a rock pool at St. John's in the Virgin Islands. And they wanted to show me carvings of tropical animals. When I saw these carvings, I said, no, 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 no. That, that is not evidence. Those tropical animals are, sh are in both places, both Africa and America. But as I was preparing to leave, the light of the sun shone on the rock, just above the rock pool. And I looked down, and I saw a strange formation, dots and crescents. And I said, nature cannot do that. Nature cannot do that. It's because it will wash against the rock and it may cause uh, a kind of uh, cleavage in the rock, but it can't make perfect curves and dots, dots and curves. It cannot do that. So I went down there and I cleaned the rock and I photographed it. I sent it to various parts of the world. I sent it to Africa. So someone in Africa, in Ghana, said it's the Green Army sign, and I said, send me evidence of the Green Army sign, and he sent it to me, and I said, no, no, no. Don't waste my time, man. That doesn't look anything like the Green Army sign. But I kept taking it wrong, and eventually Dr. Barry Fell of Harvard, he's dead now, he'd written America BC, the New York Times ran three pages attacking me and fell. I brought out, they came before Columbus, Barry Fell brought out America BC. He was dealing with other kinds of contacts. I was dealing with African contact and New York Times ran three pages attacking me and fell. They wouldn't even allow anybody in America. But fortunately for me, Dr. Clarence Wine, the oldest of American archaeologists who'd been on the place where they found the stone heads with African faces, he wrote a marvelous essay on me because he was the oldest American archaeologist. They couldn't kick out this essay. So he said, I am absolutely convinced of the soundness of Van Sortemann's conclusions. So in spite of all that, it came through. But look now, the skeletons, we cannot move on. Because recently we have another clown who's entered the Virgin Islands, and he's saying now that even though they're in strata 1250 AD, um, these skeletons could not be, um, they are, could not be Africans because they have, uh, could not be proper Africans because they have something teeth, you know, they have some problem with the teeth. 
and Africans cannot have that problem because they are some sort of nonsense, but they don't eat certain things, you know, so that they, I mean, the most absurd, I mean, it's, I, I find it difficult to remember it because it is so absurd, I do not know how long I could keep it in my golden brain. <laughs> I mean, these people are awesome. I mean, it, it, look, look, what incredible evidence. If I did not find that script which was translated, plunge in to cleanse yourself. This is water for ritual ablution before prayer. Because Barry Fell says, it's Libyan, so I sent it to the Libyan Department of Antiquities. And they came up with the translation. Plunge in to cleanse yourself. This is water for ritual ablution before prayer. And then comes a map. It's in my new book, a map of Brazil that shows independent black settlements in Brazil, pre-Columbian. And then comes the oral evidence in Mali. They speak of a king, Abu Bakari II, who wanted to cross the ocean because he felt there was land beyond. And he appears, the Mexicans report this strange black man in white robes appearing. And it is also reported by the Arabs because Mansa Musa went to Cairo, he's a Muslim, and he went to Cairo, and when he was in Cairo, he talked about, they asked him what happened to your brother, and he told him that he wanted to cross the ocean and he never came back. And it's recorded by the Arabs in al Kashandi and the Masili Kelabsar, Fir Mamili Kelamsar, so that's the documented evidence. Then there's the iconographic evidence. So I've presented 12 pieces of evidence, eyewitness accounts, methodological evidence, linguistic evidence, botanical evidence, oceanographic evidence, navigational evidence, skeletal evidence, epigraphic evidence, the script, cartographic evidence, the map, oral evidence of the Mali Greers, documented evidence, the Arabs, al Kakashani, the Masili Kalabsar, the Mamele Kalamsar, and the iconographic evidence. That is, you look at my book and you're going to see sculptures of Africans. There's everything. The texture of the hair, the shape of the faces, lips, noses, everything. And one of the things they found, and I'm not going to talk about it at this point in the lecture later, they found something that is so astonishing that they are utterly embarrassed. And this, that was found after. But here is the 13, 10, 13, 11 journeys where I present 12 pieces of evidence. I did not know of an or even earlier visit because that is what I presented the Congress and they decided to delete the word discovery. So let me make it quite clear. Truth, trust to the ground will rise again. Now we come to another part of this BC, something that happened before Christ. Now, Egyptians made a journey across the Atlantic. How did they do that? Why did they do that? How do we know that they, do it? they did it? Listen carefully. Do not confuse modern Egypt with ancient Egypt. These are two totally different worlds. Here we are in America, and it would be very difficult to find an American in this room. We call ourselves Americans because we are in America. We are American citizens. But there are African people here, European people perhaps, Asian people, but no Americans. I am part American. I am part Makusi Indian and part African. But it would be difficult to find an American audience that is pure American. That's why Egypt, do you go to Egypt? And you said, the Arab is not an Egyptian. The people who built the pyramids were not Arabs. I know, man, because I am responsible for returning to the bloody Arabs, the splinters of the Sphinx's nose and chin, and the Arabs do not want to remake it because it looks Negro. But we can go into the graves. We can go into the graves and we find the hard, hard evidence. The skeletal evidence is overwhelming. But you see, Egypt was so rich. The Africans were so extraordinary. And they were not superior people. You don't have inferior and superior people. This is what makes you superior and inferior. A certain vision of the world. A certain vision of yourself. Many of us have been destroyed, reduced. 
because we've been made to accept other people's vision of us. You look at Hitler. Hitler was a bloody lunatic. We threw, threw him in prison in his early 20s. Hitler was walking about prison like this. God spoke to him. That was an awesome person, boy. I mean, he was evil, but he was awesome. Napoleon, too. Napoleon wasn't even a Frenchman. Most people don't know that. I am destined to glorify a people I hate. Could you imagine that? That's Napoleon. I read his diaries. I am destined to glorify a people I hate. And then the one thing I regret most in my life, this is Napoleon. The one thing I regret most in my life is that I did not make Toussaint. I did not make the black Toussaint governor of Haiti. I blame it on my black wife. Do you know Napoleon was married to Malata from the West Indies, which we would call black hair? But do you know, she was the prejudiced one, not Napoleon. Napoleon wanted to make Toussaint governor of Haiti. His wife said, no, why would you give up territory to nigger? He's as crude as that. So bear in mind, here I am responsible. I financed a telephone link up between Gamal Abdul Mokhtar, the Arab delegate at UNESCO, Sheikh Anthony Up, the African delegate at UNESCO, myself, the representative of the British Museum, Garland Roberts, who found the pieces, and another gentleman who did translations from the French. And British began, no, no, Van Sertima, we can't do that. <laughs> because if we start returning this item and that item to this and that museum, we'll have no museum. I said, sir, we're not asking you to return everything from your museums. You're well aware of the things that have been taken from other museums and other places. This is a very specific thing. It is of no value to you. You can't show it. What is the point? You can't show the splinters of the nose. Nobody's interested in splinters. Put the nose back on. <laughs> but the Arabs do the Mokhtar, the Arab delegate never said a bloody word. Boy, he don't want no nigger nose interfering with the tourist trade in Egypt. He's as crude as that. Look why Egypt is no longer Egyptian. There was another people who built the pyramids. The Syrians attacked in 654 BC. The Persians attacked in 550 BC. The Greeks attacked in 320 BC. The Romans attacked just before and after Christ. The Arabs attacked 638 to 640 AD. That is why Egypt is no longer Egyptian. They have nothing to do with the building of the pyramids. If you go back in the graves, we have found hard evidence in the graves that the Egyptians were African. Let me listen to the anthropologists, all the great anthropologists, because this is hidden. This doesn't come out in history books. The earliest human fossil found in Egypt was a skeleton of the Nazlet Kataman found near Tata, Egypt, which was dated 35,000 to 30,000 years before Christ. Regarding the racial affinity of the skeleton, Toma concludes strong alveolar prognathism combined with fossil prinacillus and an African skull is suggested of negroid morphology. He proves it's a Negro. Then comes Wendorf, 1982. Wendorf the skeleton, discovered the skeleton at Wadi Kubania, located 10 to 15 kilometers north of Aswan in Egypt. This skeleton dated approximately 20,000 years before Christ. The wide nasal aperture, lower nasal margin morphology, presence of the sulcus prinacillus, wide into orbital distance and alveolar prognathism demonstrate affinities with broad African variants. All of the great anthropologists, archaeologists, Thoma, Ferenbach, Wendorf, Stuart, Green, Armilagos, Wrightmore, Crawford, all of them prove that those early Egyptians in the Pyramid Age were African. That's the reason why Mokhtar, the Arab delegate, doesn't want a Negro nose on the Sphinx because they don't want to relate back. But the Germans, 
sent me. I have it in my new book. You see a beautiful color photograph showing you what the world was 1,200 years before Christ. The black is on top of the world. He is in charge of Egypt. There's no question about it. And they built the pyramids. The Japanese came to my friend Sheikh Antony Op, asked seeking advice on building a pyramid. And Sheikh Antony Op said, do not use bronze tools. And the Japanese said, how could you say that? The last stage of the Egyptian was the Bronze Age. And he says the last age is not the best age. They, you cannot. The Japanese would not listen. They went there. They made such a mess. They had to throw them out. Bronze tools, the tools broke. They had to use air jack hammers in order to cut the stone. And they could not cut it. The stone, the ancient blacks in Egypt did. Let me tell you, this is scientists reporting with amazement at how these Africans cut stone. The mean variation of the cutting of the stone from a straight line and from a true square is but 0.01 inch in a length of center, five inches up the face, an amount of accuracy equal to most modern opticians' straight edges of such a length. In other words, we only cut eyeglasses like that. These joints with an area of some 35 square feet each were not only worked as finely as this, but were cemented throughout. Though the stones were brought as close as one five hundredth of an inch or in fact into contact, and the mean opening of the joint was one fiftieth of an inch, yet the builders managed to fill the joint with cement despite the great area of it and the weight of the stone to be moved some 16 tons. To merely place such stones in exact contact at the sides would be careful work, but to do so with cement in the joints is almost impossible. This is Flinders Petrie, our inheritance of the Great Pyramid, London, 1874. Thus the builders of these great monoliths quarried and cut stone within one one-thousandth of an inch of mat mathematical perfection and raised the man-made mounting as meticulously as we cut gems. There are approximately two million Three hundred thousand blocks of stone which comprise the Great Pyramid. These individual blocks weigh from 2.5 tons to 70 tons, as much as a railroad locomotive. Originally covered an area of 13.1 acres. The Great Pyramid, listen to this as I close on this part. The Great Pyramid contains more stone than all the churches, chapels, and cathedrals built in England since the time of Christ. If all the stone in this pyramid were sawed into blocks one foot in an edge, and these were laid end to end, they would stretch two-thirds of the way around the globe at the equator. The Great Pyramid contains enough stone to construct 30 Empire State buildings. Now, if you really knew what the African was doing, most of us would not be behaving like inferiors. You know, challenged the system a long time ago. <clears throat> the Africans had a fixation about seven. They had a fixation about seven. They created the seven-day week. There's no such thing, you know. The Africans noticed in Egypt that there are seven orifices in the human body. I can't mention all of them. There's seven primary colors in the rainbow. Violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, red. There are seven notes in the musical scale. There are seven layers of skin. There are seven parts of the human brain. There are seven parts of the human eye. Seven is critical in the ages of man. Seven is the age of reason. Fourteen, seven years later, puberty. Twenty-one, seven years later, maturation. Seven, 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 seven. That is why they created the seven deadly sins. Christ was in Egypt. He's not an Egyptian. He's a Jew. He was born in Jerusalem, but he went to Egypt. Read Hosea, out of Egypt shall I call my son. He was brought back to Jerusalem where he was crucified. Seven deadly sins, seven cardinal virtues, seven days of the week. That's the Africans created the seven-day week. There's no such thing. Seven, 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 seven. And then they sent out seven ships across the water. Now they had intimate interconnections with the rest of Africa. We have found evidence of that. Lady Lugard reports a visit of Egyptian pharaohs to Hauseland. We have found, and here is where Diop was very helpful to me, Diop and Obenga, Obenga two weeks ago introduced me to an audience in California. Obenga is the most remarkable African scholar in the world at the moment. 
Shekant Diop was before, but he died. And I managed to make contact with these gentlemen. Shekanta and I had a, a, a nice quarrel about tobacco because Shekanta was the only African who was allowed to examine mummies in a certain part of Egypt, and he found tobacco in this, this mummy, and I was explaining to him that the Africans have their tobacco, the Americans have their tobacco, and I was pointing out that certain distinctions could be made between the two tobaccos and that. In my book, they're using the same term, and I explained why they're using the same term because of a certain kind of pre-Columbian contact, but that it's not the same tobacco. Well, um, Diop surrendered and that. He was a most remarkable man. I want to dedicate this lecture to him because he had the most profound impact on so many of us. We invited him, we invited him to the Nile Valley Conference and his plane crashed. He didn't die and um, he had to be run, moved from, rushed from the burning plane and I told him, do not come by plane the next time. You are to go and visit your wife in France and then you to do overland, and then you to take another kind of ship, but do not let it be known where you're moving. Okay, we are not to talk on the telephone. You have to be very careful about that. The up came to Atlanta. That was a marvelous occasion. He was the most remarkable man I have ever met. And we had these marvelous conversations, etc. But I knew he would die soon, because like John Clark, I noticed it with him too. They do not pay attention to what they're eating. After you get 60, you have to pay close attention to what you're eating. You can't just eat any old thing because it, it dies there and it's not buried easily. So be very careful. I'm 65 and I know. I exercise every day. Okay, and that's what saved my life last year. I was. I was rushed to hospital last year, and these crooks in the hospital, they want to make money because they know Rutgers pays most of the bill, so they want to make money. Not telling they have all sorts of things on my heart. I said, there's nothing wrong with my heart. Yes, I mean, they have all these sorts of things in my heart. Three days in the hospital, and I don't know what's happening. So I got really mad, and when I get mad, I get real mad. I grew up in the bush, and when I get mad, I behave like a bushman. <laughs> and all the, all the civilized cover, that disappears completely. I just curse, smash up things, etc. And so they came, held me down. I said, I want to leave right now. They said, well, you can't leave, you know, you're very ill. Something wrong with your heart. I said, there's nothing wrong with my heart. He said, well, if you leave now, you have to pay the bill. I said, well, I've only been here three days. Yes, but your bill is $5,500. <laughs> I say, well, I'll stay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, they said, I said, but okay, I make a deal with you. Put me on a treadmill if you think there's something wrong with my heart. And I ran a mile at full speed. And then they shook their head. Well, you're on a bit of stress, but if you had run that mile the way you ran it and there was something wrong with your heart, you would have died. I said, thank you very much for being so truthful at last. But to come back, the incredible things that we find now, we found in America, not oh, that the Egyptians made a trip to America. They sent out seven ships. He found it in a tomb in Egypt. Where the, these ships, seven ships are heading towards the west. Seven was everything to them. So they sent out seven ships. And we, ha we have it in this um, painting among the Ramesses around 1200 BC. These seven ships heading towards the west. And we find intimate interconnections between the Egyptians and the rest of the Africans. Because people could say, okay, Egypt is separate. Today it is, because the Egyptians are no longer Egyptians, just like the Americans are no longer Americans. You come into this room, it would be hard to find a Native American. You go to Egypt, and it's hard to find an Egyptian. 
So be very careful about the past and the present. These worlds have changed dramatically. And so we have lots of evidence of their links to the rest of Africa. Shake Antony up and Theophilo Benga presented, and it's in my new book, more than 100 words in Wolof, a West African language, the language of Sheikh Antony of more than 100 words which are identical in all their forms. That is utterly impossible. UNESCO surrendered. All of these big professors with all their big degrees and so they had to surrender because these two super Africans proved beyond them, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that that's all a lot of nonsense. This is clearly what we say it is, and they surrender. It has been established beyond the shadow of a doubt. The connections between Egypt and the rest of Africa were extraordinary. We have Lady Lugar reporting on a visit of Egyptian pharaohs to Hauseland, an Egyptian golden breastplate found in an ancient lair in Nigeria. More than 100 Egyptian words in all their forms and variants found in Wolof, the Ops language. The African word for God, what is the word for God? Amen, you use it in your prayers, that's African. Amen, Jesus was in Egypt, you know. Out of Egypt shall I call my son. He wasn't an Egyptian, he was a Jew, but he went to Egypt. He was smuggled out by his uncle because they were killing off the firstborn. That's how Jesus landed up in Egypt. And the seven day week is Egyptian. Egyptian golden press blade found in ancient Nigeria. As I say, nearly a hundred Egyptian words in all their forms presented to UNESCO. UNESCO had to surrender. They couldn't believe it. Obenga and Diop proved it beyond the shadow of a doubt. They even take the word for God. What is the word for God in Egypt? Amen. You saying it in your prayers, that's Africa. Amen. Amon and Amen is Egyptian, and Am is West African, comes from that, and Nyam is East African. So you have Amen and Amon, Egyptian, and Am, West African, and Nyam, East African. Don't think everything is lost. There are all sorts of clues left in the past, and that if you learn certain things, you can pick them up. So they can't fool us anymore. And we find the incredible things that they did, the building of the pyramids and all these things, but they also built remarkable ships. And we have evidence, not only they show their ships moving, but they show, it is shown among the Americans, the Pope for the Bible, the Kiche Maya, I have the Bible, the Kiche Maya that shows blacks arrived in America in, before Christ. Champollion supports that, Leverbourg support, Lever, supports that, Sahagan supports that, Sorensen supports that, South Soderbergh supports that, Rosalie supports that. I've been through all these documents. They're finding these things and people are just pushing them aside, but not anymore. Then came the clincher. I was invited to, before the Columbus celebration, I was invited to the Smithsonian the leading scientific institution in this country, hoping to wipe me out before, 49, before 1992. And my opponent surrendered. Showed them the seven braid that you can argue with. No sculpture in America has seven braids. Seven is everything to the African Egyptian. He created the seven day week because he finds there's seven parts to the human brain, seven parts to the human eye, seven, seven notes in the musical scale, seven primary colors in the rainbow, seven orifices in the human body, seven layers of skin. You can't argue with that. So he, invent, he invented the seven day week. All this thing about God created the world in six days and rested in the seven, that is taken by the Christians from the Egyptians. Jesus was in Egypt. Even the word Christ, he's not Jesus Christ, he's Jesus the Christ. Christ is an Egyptian word, K-R-S-T, Christ. K-R-S-T, the anointed one. That's how he became the Christ. Don't dismiss him, okay? I'm just pointing out the terms, okay? He was in Egypt, out of Egypt. Read Hosea, out of Egypt shall I call my son. He wasn't born in Egypt, but he was smuggled out in Egypt because Herod was killing the firstborn. 
and he appears among the Egyptian doctors. And so you get certain evidences like that. And I've checked out this. I have so many sources. Champollion reporting the seven ships arriving from across the water. Champollion, Lefebvre, Sahagan, Sorensen, Sav Soderberg, Rossellini, and above all, the Bible of the Kiche Maya. They destroyed so many books in America, but they didn't enjoy, they didn't destroy all the Bibles of the Kiche Maya. So we have that reporting, these dark-skinned people arriving on seven ships, and these, they have the seven ships. And then we have the clincher. We have a map of South America found in ancient Egypt. With correct latitudinal and longitudinal coordinates, I showed that to NASA. I was the first person to go to NASA to study blacks in space. You don't even know what, it's not only we don't know the history, we don't even know what's happening. Do you know the leading technical astronaut in our space team is a black man? Colonel Gregory, he's restructured the cockpit of our spaceships. Do you know that the leading woman in our space team is a black woman, Dr. Christine Darden? She's reshaping our airplane so that in the next, in the 21st century, we've just entered certain airplanes, not just the, 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 the exotic airplanes would be able to fly faster than some. Do you know that? No. I had to go there. I nearly died at NASA because they invited me along with delegates from all over the world, China, Russia, various, to witness the blast off of the first black American in space. And I did not realize I have different ears. I grew up in a forest. I hear lights. I thought everybody heard lights. You have to hear differently in the forest. Because snakes, you can't see snakes. Snakes take on the color of trees and foliage. Therefore, you have to hear that when he starts. You have to hear that. Are you dead? I didn't know I had different ears. I thought everybody heard lights. I'm standing, these Russian and Chinese delegates, and I'm standing. It's five and a half miles away from the spaceship. This is an awesome thing. It's bigger than a house. And we're going to send, shoot it off into space. And they start to count down, and they stop. Something wrong. And I start looking now to see, how could something be wrong? You know, a big thing like that with all this incredible thing, if it explodes, what would happen? Then they start to count down again. The third time they start to count down, you had this tremendous noise and I fell over because my ears, blood came out of my ears because I hear differently from urban people. I grew up in a jungle, I hear different. So that, that, that really startled the hell out of me. I never went back to NASA after that. <laughs> but I'd learned enough about it. It's in the book, Blacks in Science, Ancient and Modern. You see me with the leading technical astronaut, etc. And you would be amazed what blacks are doing in this country. Totally unknown. Bell Labs employs more than a thousand black scientists. They created the, the transoceanic cable. They were major in that development. They're reshaping our airplanes. They they remade the cockpit of the space shuttle. You never hear about that. If a black commits a crime, yeah, that's news. Yeah. But when he does something extraordinary, oh my God, no, there's something mistake here. It's like the New York Times calling the black Val Herbe, so nobody would think it's the black. Now they're saying this Negro they found in Brazil came from. Asia, could you imagine that? She's going to take a ship all the way to the edge of South America and walk all the way up to Brazil because there are no currents of taking her. Walk all the way to Brazil to drop her bloody skull. This is the state of the world we are in. But let me show you the slides now because you have to see some of these things to believe them. So if we could shift to the slides. But the one more thing I must say, just one more thing, very important. They have found the map of South America in ancient Egypt. It was known as the Piri Reis map because of a Turkish admiral who found it there. And it has correct latitudinal and longitudinal coordinates. No European could have drawn such a map 
until after 1744 when the chronometer was invented, yet the Africans had it before Christ. They can't see it. I could put it over here. Movement across another part of the world, crossing the African continent and then going from there across the Atlantic. But here is the world 1200 years before Christ. This is Egypt. This is the German presenting this. Okay. It probably needs this is the Egyptian. Just a second. Okay. That's good. This is the world 1,200 years before Christ. You see the Egyptian black, Indo-Aryan, that is European and Asiatic types. Then comes the Nubian, black, and then comes the Semite. The Nubian is to move to another state of power later on, but here it's the world 1,200 BC. Next. This is Isis and Horus, okay. This is their, in their imagination, the conception of the mother of God and the Christ child. They don't look European, but if you get it from the modern Egyptian, you will not see that. These are rare, rare pictures. Next. That's God. That's their conception of God. Very European looking. Next. Next, that is Cheops, Khufu, Cheops, king of the fourth dynasty, builder of the Great Pyramid, one of the marvels of the world. Next, this is Kafir or Shepron, building, builder of the second Great Pyramid. If you go to Egypt, you will never see this. Never. Next, that's the Sphinx, there's the broken nose. I've returned it to the Egyptians. We wouldn't put it back on. It will cost them to lose thousands of dollars in the tourist trade because people don't want to go there to see niggers. Next. This is the common people. You see clearly. Next. Now this is the world, 1200 BC, in America. This is the civilization known as Olmec. The Olmec civilization was not created by Egyptians, it was created by Native Americans, but it has elements that are very extraordinary and non-American. In other words, there's a contact being made. Next. Now look at that. That has, apart from the facial features, because people could say, okay, perhaps, perhaps, but it has parallel incised lines, a circular ear plug. It has certain features of the helmet that are exact replica of the Egyptian 
1200 BC next. This is the Egyptian on this side and over there. This is my friend Jairaz boy showing the, um, um, so this is the, in America and that over there is in Egypt, but Jairaz boy is not a great photographer. Next. Now look at this one. Pay close attention to this, because this is what led my opponent at the Smithsonian to surrender. <laughs> now they're trying to explain this away, and so they said the reason why it looks black is because it was made of black stone. <laughs> and another reason why it may look black is because it was originally made of white stone, but it turned black over time. Do you know, suit of age. But now look, that is the front of the head next. That's the side of the head next. That's the seven braids. Never before and never again. There are only two heads like that, and the second one they shaved off. I was lucky to get that one in time. They shaved the second one off. Now look at that, seven, seven, seven. Seven orifices of human body, seven layers of the human brain, seven layers of skin, seven orifices, and then seven, 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 seven. That is their signature. Next. There's another one. Don't think he's black, he's just made of black stone. <laughs> next. Yeah, that's another one, next. Next. This is the America before Christ. This is von Nutteno, my good friend, last of the Royal House of Germany. He's showing pictures of an African here and one a stone head in America there with those features next. This is it again. Head of Nuba Chief from Kenya with Olmec Negroid stone head at bottom next. Now this is nothing to do with Africans. This is what you call a weird jaguar, where they had certain fantasies about the jaguar who prowled along the, the edge of the settlements, so they would sometimes fuse this thing so that that's a jaguar. That has no, they're gonna say the reason why it looks black. This doesn't look black, damn it. This is something totally different. Next. That's a weird jaguar, that ain't no nigger. Next. Get me real vexed, you have to call these things out. That's a Native American woman. Do you know my opponents say that that Native American woman is a spitting, images, spitting image of all the stone heads you just saw? <laughs> what incredible spit. Next. Next. Here, look at this. I was sent a photograph by this by a friend in Mexico. Do you, the Mex do you know the Mexican government refused to remove this? An earthquake threw this up, but it looked so Negro, they allowed it to sink back in the earth. I was tempted for a while to hire a helicopter and pick the damn thing up. <laughs> but do you know what this weighs? About 15 tons. You can't pick that up with an ordinary helicopter. Next. So it sunk back into the earth. Now look at this. This is another evidence of cheating. They found this guy with a strange headdress and a ball in the nose and an artificial beard. Look what they did with it. Next. They made a straight nose and they called him Uncle Sam. <laughs> Next. Now this is the Egyptian Tutankhamun. Now the important thing here is this, the bird and the serpent. There's a bird at the bottom and a serpent on top. The reason why they have the bird and the serpent, the serpent is the lowest, the earth, and the bird is the highest, the sky. So they're joining earth with sky. Now nobody had that except Egyptians. That was part of, central to their philosophy next. Suddenly in America, where we have evidence of a contact, we we found actual skeletons at Tlatelco said at Las Misas and Monte Alban. They found women who were clearly Native American lying beside African men. I mean, clear, clear. Tlatelco said at Las Misas and Monte Alban. African men lying beside, these are in the graves. 
Now here you have, in addition to that pre evidence of a physical presence, here you then, here the Olmec, the first major American civilization, they were, it was created by Africans, but at a certain stage when these Africans, they're, they are imitating certain aspects, bird and serpents, they didn't have it before next. Here is it among the Mayans much later, imitating the Olmec, next. Here is the double crown, and this is the American, the double crown with the stick, the snake-headed stick which appears in, in Egypt too next. Here is an unusual ceremony, that's the Egyptian, where you have the priest, this is opening the mouth of the dead, exact same thing in America. Here is this figure with an um, animal, tail between his legs, animal thing over his head, a snake-headed stick, and here you have this animal thing and the snake-headed stick performing the same ceremony. Different art, same idea in detail. Now if you find one or two of those, coincidence. But there's certain thing known as overwhelming incidence of coincidence cancels out a mere coincidence. Next. Here the Egyptians are pouring cross streams over third god. Here in America, these guys are pouring cross streams. Look at the pots. Pouring cross streams over third god in the Mexican Codex. And he happens to look black. Next. Here is the phallic cult. Here in the middle is the Egyptian god Min holding his phallus. There's also the phallic cult, but I'm not allowed, the phallic procession, I'm not allowed to show that in mixed company. Next. And here is the bird ba. It's a pity this thing is turned around. But the Egyptians have a hole in the sarcophagus and the bird with a human head flies through the hole. This is repeated in America. Next. Here at Izapa, there's the hole in the sarcophagus and the human-headed bird is flying out of the hole. Next. Here again, this is the Egyptian god Sokar. He's standing on the back of a snake which has a head at the head, head at the tail, and he's holding up his wings. This is very unusual. He doesn't have wings. He's holding wings. And this has a head at the head, head at the tail. That's Egyptian. Next. Come to America. Here is god Sokar standing on the back of a snake, holding up his wings, head at the head, head at the tail. Next. Here is the human-headed coffin. That one is in Costa Rica, in, Ameri in the Americas, and that one is from Nubia, on the edge of Egypt. Next. Here is the double rope swallowing god. We couldn't get a very good example. It is written in, in, this, in the literature. It shows uh, identity, but we couldn't get good pictures of it. Next. Here is a very unusual, very unique thing where you tear out the heart of man to feed the sun god. This was symbolic in Egypt. It became terrifyingly real in Mexico. We would tear out the hearts of certain people in order to feed the sun god. Next. Here also in Achalcatzingo in Mexico, in America, ancient America, in order to show power over territory, you put your hand up. You, you, you cut it in a high place and cut out the hand to show this is my territory. Okay, next. Here it is in Egypt too, in Nubia rather, where you have over territory, you have an ark and you see the hand held up showing power over territory. These are very unique <coughs> rituals. Next. Here again. Ramses III, Egyptian, throwing pellets of incense in a hand-shaped cup. Here in America, they're showing pellets of incense in a hand-shaped cup. Next. Now this is in America. And for those of you who doubt that is an African, next. That's the proof, next. <laughs> okay, next, please. Okay. This is, um, what was that? Leventa, yes. Here are figures now of African types in America before Columbus, some before Christ, showing texture of hair very distinct. 
from the straight hair of the Native American. Very distinct. And yet it's found in early America. Next. This is the African. This is in Mexico. Obviously somebody must have got into Mexico. Next. That's a Chalcatzingo next. That's, a, that's also in America. Look at the texture here, very distinct from the straight hair of the Native American. Next. Beards. It's not only the hair now, you're dealing with beards. The beard is so unusual on the Native American chin that when it appeared on one Native American chin, a lot was written about it. They were so startled. I lived among these people. I grew up among the Native Americans. My mother and father were divorced when I was a very small boy. It was the first divorce in our country, and I was brought up by Native American women. I know these people. They don't have beards like that, and they don't have hair like that. How come this appears? This is before Christ in Mexico. This is around the time I speak of with the Egyptian contact. How is that? Next. Again, well, we saw that before. That's the Mexican. That's it. No, that's all right. We saw that before. That's, um, this is black gods in medieval Mexico. This is the trader god, Echua. Next. Next. Now that is the Mandingo voyages. This is an early 14th century head. Remember, when I say early 14th century, I'm talking about 1310, 1311. Columbus came in 1492, which is practically almost, uh, it's not just, it's the end of the 15th century. Now look at this, perfect. Next. This is what I found and chalked up in the United States Virgin Islands, just a few miles from where they found the African skeletons. Next. This is the translation at Harvard, Barry Fell's decipherment, which was checked out with the Arabs in Libya, found to be correct. Next. That's again in America, next. All these from America, early America, next. Now that is around the time of the 1310, 1311 contact. This they had a black god, the Mexicans had a black god called Tezcatlipoca. And so since he, this human was black, they carved him out to represent the god Tezcatlipoca. Next. These are bearded Negroid wanderers in medieval Mexico in the Mechmishtec Codex Durimburg, 14th century. They're showing these types appearing in America very distinct from the Native American type. Next. That's Costa Rica. Next. That's from Mexico. That's South America. Next. South America. Next. These are descendants of black governors in Ecuador. Next. Here they are in color. Where um, a body of Africans took control over a certain part in South America, in Ecuador, and these are their descendants. Next. Now comes the clincher. This was found in ancient Egypt when the Egyptians were African. This is a map of South America. I showed it to NASA. NASA said no European could have drawn this map. Europeans did not know how to plot latitude and longitude until after 17... 44 when the chronometer was invented. This map has, it is only one degree off from our space maps. It was drawn by the African Egyptians. On that note, I'll close. Thank you.
Um, before you go, I'd like to answer no, 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 some no. questions. Yes. Do not leave yet. Please, please. I just want one thing to do, because this was supposed to be election shake the up. I did not do election shake the up. I did it on my latest book, but I'd like to read. This is just a paragraph. Something in tribute to Shekanta Diop. It deals with my first meeting with Shekanta. It's brief, so listen to it. I felt a strange sense of awe in his presence. It was the awe of nobility and graciousness, perhaps, the quiet air of intellectual authority, the legend of his life and his work that had preceded him. Shekanta tried to come to Atlanta, where we were holding a conference. He was to be the head but his plane crashed, so I was put in charge of the conference. But the next time he came through, and this is my impression of him seeing him for the first time. His eyes never left me as he spoke, but though his gaze and his grip were firm, his voice was surprisingly soft. The sibilances of his French rose and fell upon my brain like waves of whispers. Monsieur Diop was all I could say, we meet at last. It was a cool blue London day the light of a premature springtime loitering like a stranger on the streets of a winter morn. January the 13th, 1985, about a year and a month before his death. We had exchanged long letters. We had spoken on occasion on the telephone. I had read his work in English, he my work in French. He had followed avidly the issues of the Journal of African Civilizations. Yet nearly a decade was to pass before we met face to face. That week in London, we talked to pack houses, we dined, we discoursed, we debated. Diop's great friend of many years, Carlos Moore, made us feel at times as though we were conversing in the same language. But in spite of the growing familiarity, my sense of awe and reverence in his presence persisted. I saw him more as a father than as a comrade in arms. I felt the long road that I would still have to walk. I could not shake off the impression of being in the shadow of an elder spirit. It is not for us to say that the death of a man comes too early or too late. Fate is far too complex. But let us venture to say that we in America needed a guide and a teacher like Diop. Africa, above all, needed a leader like Diop. Had he lived to become president of Senegal, he might have piloted some of the nations of West Africa into the first stages of a federated state. His passing, therefore, is a very great blow to us all. Yet history teaches us that men like these do not die at the time of their deaths. Often it is that the fall of a great teacher or prophet is the beginning of the rise of his ideas. So let it be with Dio. You could, you could go and sit over there. Okay, you know, after, after the meal, there's dessert, right? And that's going to come in terms of the questions that you positioned to, uh, to Dr. Van Sordeman. So, who's going to be first? Come up, just line up behind the microphones, and just make the questions to the point. Okay, first question, just a second. Okay. Um, I'd like to. No, no, no. It's okay. Thank you. Go I'd ahead, like to dear. start by saying thank you for the tremendous body of work that you've um, amassed for our um, enhancement. And um, excuse me. I'm going to be leaving the country in a couple of weeks. I'm going to be going to Amsterdam. I perform, and a lot of times all I get to do is just go there, perform, and come home. But since um, being informed of your information. I want to know, is there anything in Amsterdam, like any place that I could go and look up some things while I'm there? I never went to Amsterdam. Um, they don't have no. any great um, I don't know anything about places to... I don't. You see, one of the things about me, um, I'm very introverted. Mm -hmm. I could pass to a place without seeing it. Okay, you could bring me back to this room five years later. I would not remember the room. That is one of the things that um, affected me in early life because when I move, I have moved about seven times. Mm -hmm. When I move to a new place, I cannot find it. Okay, like I go to my house, I cannot find my house. 
in the first week I move. That's why they have to draw a map for me, etc. So places disappear with me. People I remember. I may not remember their faces, but I remember their voices. I remember their spirit, what essence comes out of them, etc. So that you pay in some ways when you get advantages in one way, nature takes something else the out the other way, it seems so to me. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Question over there. Uh, Dr. Van Sertimer, I'd like to thank you for the information that you've given to us this afternoon. And I know that it's really like a review for my husband and I and my sister. And we were so fortunate to meet with Van Werthenau in Mexico and to see all that you spoke of this afternoon, to sit with him, to have him speak with us, and to show us many of the artifacts that you've shown us today. Thank you so much, dear. Hotep, my brother. Ask I'm over here. Oh, Hotep, <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you for uh, all the works you have done and you know, given us throughout the years, my brother, and the, what you have done here today. Uh, I would like you to, to set the record straight on, uh, on, on this, what it took to build the pyramid, or on, you can speak on, on slavery and building the pyramid, if you can set the record straight on that. No, we do not know um, the, we know the, the engineering skills that were involved in that. But I've never studied slavery, okay? The first time I studied slavery, I drank poison. There are two things that I don't study, primitives and slaves. It has profoundly affected the minds of many people. In fact, most of them have become experts in slavery and slaves. I'm not saying that you shouldn't, you should be very much aware of that. But when I was at London University, the first year, everything was primitives. They were not interested in African intelligence, African genius. They knew nothing about African genius. Egypt, even to this day, you go to the universities in Europe, none of them would admit the Egyptians were African. Were it not for remarkable people like Obeng and Job, we would not know that. We would not have pictures of these people shown. Like in my new book, you're going to see African, you're going to see Egyptian pharaohs with African faces, etc. So that was one of the things. I decided in order to save my life, because after the first year in university studying primitives, because that was all the English were interested in. Primitives, primitives. They'd go into the bush and find some little insignificant African tribe and study it to death and write a whole book, the Wooga Boogoo, the Wooga Boogoo. I decided, no, I want to study high civilizations in Africa. Okay. Um, that may be a prejudice of mine, but I had to save my life because at the end of the first year I drank poison. I tried to commit suicide. And uh, the doctors, I was unconscious for three days. And when I awoke on the third day, the doctor said, I drank enough poison to kill three Englishmen. Boy, that made me feel so good. I'm <laughs> It, it really killed the Englishman inside of me. <laughs> yes. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, good evening, Mr. Sardama. Um, this is really two questions. Um, I wanted to know what was it that actually changed you as far as gearing, your, gearing towards African studies when you attended um, university in London? And two is, did you hear anything about that um, shrine found in Nigeria last year? Allegedly, it could be Queen Sheba's grave. I'm not sure. Le legend of what? Queen Sheba's grave. The possibility of Queen Sheba's grave found Who's in Nigeria. Queen, she? Queen Sheba. Oh, Sheba. Queen of Sheba, sorry. No, I haven't heard about that. I haven't heard about that. But the first question, could you repeat? Because I lost it in the second. Um, I wanted to know what, what changed you. What was it that changed you when you went to the, um, college in London that geared you towards African studies? Well, my committing, trying to commit suicide. Okay, that, that is what changed me, because I nearly died twice. The first time was um, in my own country where every, all of my friends died except me. I was dying at the age of nine because uh, a strange mosquito called the Nophilies had entered the jungle region, and uh, we would get these great fevers, and then they would put us down. 
The doctors told my father it was no point saving my life because my brain was damaged. My brain is damaged. Okay, that is what saved my life. <laughs> because I had to seek other ways out, which normal people do not. Because, for example, for a while I couldn't tell my right hand from my left. I have to shake it. Um, I can't drive a motor car unless somebody's sitting beside me because once I turn the corners, once I turn two corners, I don't know where I am. Unless I've done it several times. So I mapped, I had to map out my way from my house to the school. Okay, things like that. And then uh, this business about I have to shake my hand in order to tell right from left. So the doctors told my father, it's better to put me down because I'm brain damaged. So they decided to um, put me down, but I woke, they, they brought in the priest, I had a raging fever, and the priest threw holy water in me, and the water was so damn cold and I was so damn hot, the shock <laughs> woke me up. Okay. But that, the one thing that comes out of that experience is you begin to realize sometimes your disadvantage can become your advantage. That is very important. Because many of us, as African Americans, are at a certain disadvantage, but you have to use it not to destroy yourself, but to remake yourself. That is quite possible. Yes. Dr. Bansu, to me, your lectures are always an inspiration. I try to follow you wherever you go. Thank you. Man. Now, um, I have two questions. One is, um, in reference to, to Russia, um, I know, I read in, your, in one of your books, African presence in early Asia about the black Egyptians of the ancient time, the cold chase, I think it is. Um, can you speak on that? Uh, I can. No. That Asia is not my area. Um, I edited that, but uh, I'll, I don't want to tell you the whole story. My country is half Asian and half African. Okay? And I fell in love with an Asian girl when I was very young. And her father tried to chop my head off, <laughs> okay? So Asia, that's one book I co-edited with Rashidi. I let him do the Asia okay. stuff, okay? So Asia is a little blank to me, okay? Forgive me because that I shouldn't have, it's not a prejudice, it's just a blank, okay? So I can't talk on Asia. Okay. Uh, the other thing is I know that the Germans built a, a little um, mobile object that went into one of the pyramids, I think it is, and discovered some hidden the, um, monuments. I don't know if you know the... Yeah, they, they found... Can you them. speak on that? Yeah, um, I can't remember his name now. What? Yeah, but I don't know if that specific thing, but I know they found... Some, they put some camera on this, and they found a black man, but they didn't open the door. They, then a black man, I mean the image of a black man, the sculpture or something like that. But they haven't given us further information on that. John something, I can't remember, he writes now and then for the New York Times. Uh, he reported on it, but when we tried to follow it up, we just got a blank. Nobody would tell us what's going on there. So that is a... That is something in process. We don't really know. Okay. First of all, this is indeed a pleasure, and to meet we, to meet you and actually hear you, because I've heard so much about you, and it's I'd say that it is uh, God's plan for me to be here today. I just happened to hear that you were going to be here, and I'm here. Thank you. And you've also validated. I'm a minister, and I'm a I'm an, I consider myself anointed. Okay, uh, and I had the privilege of teaching men in the jails. This is not a speech, but I make them go through a ritual. And I say, when they ask me what color was Christ, I tell them, I don't know what color he was, but I know he was an African, and you just certified that for me. And they ask me what color were the Jews, I said, I don't know what color Jews were, but I know that the nation of Israel was in Egypt, and then I asked them, where is Egypt? They said, it's a country. No, Egypt is on the continent of what continent? And they say, Africa. I let them say that. And I said, well, then the Israelites were 
African people formed on the continent of Africa. So you've just verified that for me today. I, I, I can't I, verify that. I can't. I can't. But I'm, I'm saying that. I know that. Um, yes. You see, that is a very complex thing, really, uh -huh. because um, Jesus, for example, was smuggled out of Jerusalem to Egypt. Okay. Uh, right. Um, he's not Jesus Christ. He's Jesus the Christ. Absolutely. Christ, the anointed. The Egyptian word, Karast, yes. the anointed one. But in order to escape the wrath of Herod, um, he was smuggled into Egypt, and um, he grew up among the Egyptians. And okay. they have in Hosea, out of Egypt shall I call my son. But he was a Jew of Jerusalem. Okay. And he was crucified by the Jews. Right. Okay, came over there with some strange, he went back with some strange ideas which got him into trouble eventually. Okay, mm -hmm. but I can't swear, you know, the terms of race there. That, that is a very shady business. Mm -hmm. We do have uh, people who've put forward theories about the black Jew, but there may be have been different types of Jews because it's not a race, it's a religion. Okay, so that you have a problem, you have a problem there, it's not easy to solve. There's some people who comment on it with some authority, but sometimes they come on it with a certainty which is which is which throws a shadow. I okay, see. because it's a very complex question. There's no question, however, that Jesus was in Egypt. Because Herod was killing the firstborn, and that's yes. why he was smuggled into Egypt, and he grew up among the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. He's not Jesus Christ, as I say, because Christ is not a Jewish word. It's an Egyptian word. It's Karast, K-R-S-T, Karast. I see. Okay, so it's Jesus the Karast, Jesus the Christ. Okay, okay. but it's still, is it still Africa? I mean, yes, it's still well, he African. Himself may still not say have African. been African because that is what the Egyptians gave him that the, this extraordinary man is the, the Karast. Okay. okay. But he would have more in contact with the Africans. He would, was, he appears at 12, you know, talking to these African, uh, you know, the African priests, etc. So Jesus owes more of his education to the Africans than to the Jews. Absolutely. Yes, yes. thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Van Sertema, we are grateful for your presence in our community today. And I took several of my grandchildren to hear you at Northeastern a year or so ago, and they're studying in Nigeria now. I would like to know which of your books would you recommend to them to start reading your works? Blacks and Science, Ancient and Modern. Blacks and Science, I always advise my students, that's the book you start with. Because most people think Africans lived in the jungle. NASA told me that Africa has less jungle than any other continent comparable with its land space. We not only mismeasured the intelligence of the African, we mismeasured Africa. Africa is a lot larger than we thought it was. We have to redraw maps. From outer space, we find Africa is a lot larger than we thought it was. And in terms of its land space, it has less jungle than any other continent. It doesn't have less jungle than any other continent. It has less jungle than any other continent comparable with its land space. There may, uh, the, the Africans were doing things far in advance of Europe. The Africans were the first people to produce steel. They, uh, in my book, Blacks and Science and Children Modern, I... Um, Schmidt and Avery went to Africa and found Africans were producing, they, they had the machines, they were able to have to rebuild the machines. Africans were producing steel long before Europe. The finest swords in Europe, Damascus swords, were made from African steel. These people would go to, I wonder if they could turn off that music, it's disturbing me. Okay. Um, the Africans were producing steel at temperatures of about 1,800 degrees centigrade, okay, 
200 degrees higher than anything produced in Europe. And people would come into the ports of Dar es Salaam, pick up the steel, and take it to Europe. Europe made its finest swords, the Damascus swords, using African steel. They did not even know that. The Africans had astronomical observatories at Namorotunga. Um, they had an observatory linked to seven stars in the sky. They had incredible, incredible things they were doing, not because they were superior. You can't have inferior, superior people. Man is man is man. Man has different faces, different colors of skin, different textures here according to climate. Even the African, one African is different from the other African. You have Africans with narrow, straight noses. If you're born in dry heat, you have a narrow nose. If you're born in moist heat, you have a broad nose. A lot of people don't know that. You have the Negro African, the Nilotic African, the and different types of the Pygmy African, different types of African according to climates. And it has nothing to do with inferiority or superiority because in fact, recently they found a man in Africa who is smarter than any human being on earth. And you, you found the extraordinary things. They found that the African students who go to London University are in advance of the English students. Oh, that was another question I wanted to ask you. Um, in Nigeria, where I just came from and have spent several months this year there, uh, the light goes out frequently. And I'm wondering whether the people there really understand how learning is taking place because I see the doctors in the medical school and I see the different students and scholars and they don't have any of the equipment that we have here but they come to America these doctors come to America take the medical examination and pass and it's, it's ironic that they don't have all of these man-made tools, no computers to speak of. And I just wanted to know, what is your directive for the young people in this country for the 21st century? Well, I, I, can't, I can't easily <laughs> give advice on that, okay? I come from so many wars that it's very difficult because, you see, I do not know America as well as the places I have been through and remember. So you, please remember that. You see, I can't come, I can't, I, I, I can give information that inspires and that corrects false judgments and assumptions, but I cannot give advice on how people can direct their lives. I know that they should become aware of these things. That is very important because most people read all sorts of trash and all they read the new, or they may read the newspapers. The newspapers is important for you to have a grasp on what is going on in the world. But a lot, half the newspapers trash, more than half. Okay, and a lot of people don't realize you can't just read the newspaper. You have to find the finest books. And sometimes it doesn't lie only in the old classics. But it's very difficult to advise, except that, I, I mean, I may appear partially if I said that they read the journal, but the journal is very important. I read it, even though I'm the editor. Three years pass, I have to go back and read these things. I read them with amazement and surprise. How did I write this? How did these other authors, etc.? So you see, that is very important. I created the journal. I have published about 90-something writers from all over the world. I published 22 Europeans. I published about 53 Africans. I've published African, when I say African, include Africans and African Americans, etc. I publish people from all over the world. Once I know that they have a command of the subject, a command of a certain body of information, okay? Um, but to give general advice like that, you know, it's not easy because different lives, different things like that. I mean, I was, um, my life is a very strange one because when I left my country, I left in great despair. I thought I wanted to kill myself because 
We were never given a chance to vote. 